is Peter Gilbert. So, Peter, um, you really think that this is like an interview or, or like a podcast type interview, but this is um, this is really an intervention. We've brought all your family here today. <laughs> Should I not be drinking this beer? Is that a part of it? <laughs> no, they're 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 worried that you're not drinking enough, partying enough. Oh, I can I can push down on that accelerator anytime. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're here in Pinehurst now, huh? How long have you lived in Pinehurst? Pinehurst, it'll be eight years today. Whoa, today you know it by the day. No, you're it's like today, November tenth. You're not. A, you're not only a conspiracy theory I'm evangelist. You are right a now. savant with the calendar. <laughs> no, tomorrow will be eight years. Can you tell me what happened in 1972? What day it was, and what you were doing at 2 p.m. I was watching the uh, <laughs> the Watergate um, episode. You know, seeing what was going to happen with Nixon. Oh, no, I thought I you were in the White House at that time. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were grooming me. <laughs> when did just just so we're clear, when did the White House take place? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Yeah, that was my former life, so we can't go there. I I promised I would keep that quiet. That's that's all undercover, under wraps. So, how in the hell did you end up in Pinehurst, North Carolina, of all places, Oof. from? from Carlsbad, California. I think I believe that was your your last uh, known residence. Yeah, so it's uh 25 years in the corporate world of golf, 20 of them in Titleist and almost 5 at Golf Pride, but I was on the East Coast to start at Titleist and then went to the West Coast for about 17 of those years. Mm. And I was in Carlsbad, which is kind of the Silicon Valley of golf. And I had resigned that position to kind of start my own consulting business and looking at some other product creations, still in sports equipment, but uh, not specific in golf. And I got a call from uh, Jeff Fiorini to come in and have a chat with him about a R&D position at Golf Ride. They were looking for somebody to head up their R&D. And uh, we hit it off. I mean, personalities were a great fit. Their whole team was amazing. It was a great energy. It was a more laid back environment. Um, above them, it's a little bit more corporate, but in the, in the thick of the day-to-day battle at Golf Pride, it was, it met kind of that more entrepreneurial spirit that I was looking for. Yeah. So I came out here in 2011. Cool. Um, back at, um, back at Titleist, um, you were, you were in, was it Irons and Woods or were you just Irons or? It was what Irons. What was going on back then? It was, it was primarily Irons and some of the hybrids that were. You'd call it more of an iron style hybrid, and we had responsibility to the wedge team, which um, I managed in the beginning. And then when we brought Voki in, uh, my team continued to manage the computer modeling, uh, the testing, the consumer research, and any of the commercialization, getting it into production. Yeah, Voki. Um, Vo- so Voki was there after you. You were there before Voki, huh? Yeah, Voki came in. I'm trying to think, I was. I moved to California in 94. I think he was in 97 or 98, maybe. Uh, he's, he's a good dude. Yeah, he's super nice. What do, you, what do you think about metal wood technology and how much, how much it's changed from the days that, uh, from, from those early days when you, were, when you guys were working on metal woods and some, probably some of the first metal woods, really. Not really the first ones, but um, I don't know. What was the, what was the first metal wood that you, that you, were, that you had a hand in? You know, I got to see it really because metal woods were just start getting more popular. You know, TaylorMade was on the front edge of commercializing that, bringing it to market. It started out really as a, a durability play when you went to a driving range and there was with the clubs that you'd be loaned so that they wouldn't break. And um, we still had persimmon at Titleist when I started there. It was a very small niche, high-end but we had uh, on our staff, we had several tour players, Dan Forsman, uh, Joey Sindelar, Davis Love. They were still using persimmon in the early 90s. Yeah, yeah I remember so, that. Um, Unfortunately, I do. Yeah. They, I mean, the <laughs> Fortunately, trend, I'm as old as you are. The transition was really slow. These guys get very, very particular about sound quality and the look of it. You know, it's got to set up square to their flight line. And the early metal woods, 
looked a little bit unsightly because it was going through a casting process versus, you know, hand work and hand hewn with uh, sandpaper and all that, where you had a lot more control on the shape. But similarly, you didn't have quality control because you're dealing with wood, which is a laminate, and everyone's going to be a little different. Metal wood gave you a much higher quality. So we got to watch that evolve with, I'm trying to think, we had just a Titleist driver. It was called Titleist driver. Then we started to call them the Pro Trajectory, and then we started to get into the numbering series where you went into 975, D, and the uh, and the J. What was, what was nine? What what did 975 stand for? Do you um, remember? Yeah, I don't. You know, because I, I know that because I know now they're into. Uh, it's kind of like uh, later on they started doing it by year, right? It's kind of yes. like matched up to years. Little bit. Uh, yeah, it seemed like it was. They were, you know, what you're absolutely right because I remember we were struggling when the year 13 came around. Mm-hmm. Putting 13 on the bottom was people were struggling with. Is that going to be a bad luck number? Um, oh, that's interesting. And so, was it bad luck number? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Nine was so they were the, you you hold the first digit for metal woods got nine. Irons had an array. They would go as uh, from six series, seven series, eight series. And then there was five series were mostly the hybrids. And what else do we have in there? And so it stayed that way for a while. But sometimes you start to run into some roadblocks when it comes to trademarks. Mm. Tell me about that sound. Like, you know, when Metal Woods first came out, was it, um, were they loud? Or were you guys dampening them at that time? No, nah, they were. Everybody was putting in this foam base. Yeah, that foam um, and foam injection, right? Yep, to quiet them down. And they were trying to make model. it sound like a persimmon. Exactly. And then, and then the trend started to go to loud. Yep. And yep. then it kind of came back again. I don't know what it is today. It seems like some are loud, some are. There's a frequency in there. I'm, I'm probably going to get this number somewhat wrong. I want to say it's around. 3,700, between 3,500 to 3,900 is a frequency that's appealing to most uh, consumers. Uh, And when you go up above that and it starts getting too high pitched, I mean, Cobra had a driver one time and so too did uh, Nike. That's one that most people remember. It was just, it was just so loud and so high pitched. It was kind of irritating. It's kind of like my voice to your voice. Yes, exactly. My, my voice is like right in the key spot, and yours is slightly irritating. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought you were going the other way with that. <laughs> nah, I think that's I think that's more like it. Um, but they still do some sound tuning, so you'll put it together, and it's pretty it's pretty much engineered before it goes into production. But you'll still put a little bit of glue down on one of the panels to uh, if if you get like a what they call a little resonance down there. Any cool tour stories back in the day when you were uh when you were designing or any any of the guys you worked with? I'm sure you did you did some testing uh with with your tour guys on staff and Yeah, we would take any new product that we were working on in prototype form would get shown to a tour player to one give them an opportunity to kind of chime in. They liked being a part of the process and we needed their input anyway particularly when you're fine-tuning, you know, flight or feel or the way the soul goes through the ground. Um, a lot of interesting stories. Uh, I remember working a little bit with Steve Stricker, and we were having a hard time getting him in into, into an AP2. And he was in, I think it was a 755 at the time. And I knew that the product that he was in was his progressive blade length, which meant the center of gravity would shift closer to the hosel axis. Mm. And he was used to it. He was playing exceptionally well. And the AP2 was a constant blade length. So, you know, the conversations were him, with him were, you know, how do we get this where we can match up with what you like in ball flight and then still put you into this AP2 chassis where you've got some other benefits when it comes to sound quality and uh, mass distribution, so higher inertia properties. And so we could go inside the body and, you know, weld in little oh, features wow. and kind of shift it around for him. That's cool. Yeah, it was fun. Who's 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 some of the nicest? Who are the nicest guys to work with? Who are who are who are your favorite guys? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put you on the spot and uh, and <laughs> ask you who the worst guys are because we we could probably identify them anyhow. <laughs> you know, they're all pretty cool. I mean, they all have their own kind of obviously interesting character. But uh, Faxon's an amazing human being, just incredibly genuine, authentic. You know, looks you in the eye, gives you all the time of day, has good. You know, personable conversations. His his buddy Davis loves the you know that the group of them usually run together. 
Uh, one that was not on our staff was super nice was Freddie Couples. I mean, these are the people you even read about and hear about. So there's no surprises there. Um, Zach Johnson's a lot of fun to work with. There's a bunch. There's a bunch out there. Really nice guys. That's cool. So um, you you spend 20 years in paradise. <laughs> Carlsbad. Carlsbad. Where did you live anyhow? Were you in Carlsbad or, yeah, I was in or Carlsbad. you in Oceanside? No, I was you right there. look like an Oceanside guy. I should have been. I actually, I looked at a lot of properties there. There were there was a better price, but I couldn't find anything close enough to the beach. Carlsbad, I got something just outside the that old uh, the historic village area. So, oh, that village is great. Yeah, no, what was your favorite restaurant there? Oh gosh, uh, Vigalucci's was good. Now I'm starting to plug them. Oh, Vigalucci's is great. Coyotes was a good drinking place. A lot of good, good, a lot of good drinking holes. Coyotes was it, was it, that was more in the village. In that, yep, yeah, it wasn't, yeah. It wasn't by the water or anything like Jay's, that. Jay's, the seafood, Jay's seafood was really, it was great. That was one of my favorites. Jay's, where's that? On it's the railroad up, tracks? No, so no, that up, was the fish house up close to PCH. And so, if you know where Coyote Bar was, and then you go towards the ocean and you cross the street, you're gonna, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was right that there pizza the joint across the, across the street from it, yep, on the corner there, right? That's right. Oh man, that was good. I lived there for, um, god. It'd be about, I want to say it was about 15 years in Carlsbad. It's unbelievable. You can't beat the weather. No. You know, <laughs> nice. 75 degrees and sunny every day. Well, everybody says that, but it'll, it, the yeah, wintertime, it'll gloom. drop at night in January and February. It'll drop down to 40, which I don't mind. I still, you know, I mean, I'm a Northeastern boy. I'm originally from uh, Boston, so it's all oh, good by you? me. Yeah, it's fine by me. Wow. Boston. So you went from, from Boston to Carlsbad? Yes. Wow, that's uh, that'd be that'd be pretty good actually. That was a pretty good deal. Did you live on the ocean in uh, Boston? Uh, I grew up on the ocean, but uh, I mean, I grew up close to the ocean, a couple of miles away. We were not right on it, but I've been sp- spent most of my time in along the coast, situate Marblehead, and now Pinehurst. Now Pinehurst, yeah, I've lived in some pretty good places. <laughs> I've been fortunate with uh, my career choices. Pinehurst has been uh, is a is a pretty good place. It's uh, compared to California, you know, you could slow down, no traffic. <laughs> um, Not no, if you talk to people. Some people no get, restaurants. Some people get really frustrated. They're waiting like two more minutes around that rotary. I'm like, no, around the uh, around the the roundabout. Yeah, I go out, drive out, fly out to L.A. and drive around that area, and, and then then get back to me. You're about ready to go hit some roundabouts over in uh, in France. I think they I have am. roundabouts there, yeah. don't they? Yep. You know they do in Scott. I, you know I've never been to France. Oh, you're missing out. God, that's the best food. Yeah, a little escargot, a little foie gras. <laughs> Every, Ooh, man. Yeah, we'll have that. I'm getting hungry. I'll take pictures and send it to you. We need to. Uh, we need to uh, do that. Um, what else? What else can we talk about today? Give me something good. Oh, what else you want to talk about? You want to talk about technology and golf clubs? You want to talk about? Um, Tell me something. What What do you think? Uh, where the golf industry, any, any, what's, where's the golf industry going these days? And, um, from technology standpoint, what do you, what do you think's happening there? Good things, bad things? Good things. Um, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of room in the fitting world. The fitting has become more, um, promising because people are recognizing the benefits. They're seeing it when they go out and play a round of golf. There's going to be a deeper study in terms of linking, a person's what I'll call game diagnostics to their Mm -hmm. equipment and the courses that they're playing and how they play them. There's going to be a deeper dive, I think, when it comes to shaft fitting, because right now it's, you start with a guess based on the consumers, the club that they're using right now and their load profile or how you're looking at how they swing the golf club. And it's, it's the only way you can do it. But as the instrumentation and electronics get more sophisticated with the miniaturization of accelerometers and stuff like that you're seeing in phones, you start embedding that in a golf club for testing purposes or yeah. fitting purposes. Yeah. You're going to see... Uh, I think like that that company, um, Arcos, yeah. I believe it is. Yep, Arcos. Yeah, they're, they're kind of... It seems like they're leading that technology into exactly what you're talking about. Shot tracking, sure. Yeah, that's that's a that's a cool feature. Um, who do you think the best shaft company is in the world? Oh, it's got to be VA. It's a small little company out of 
Piners. <laughs> a little company? <laughs> Gigantic. Gigantic. What are you talking yeah, about? Right. Yeah, they are. The, their image is really, really big. That's right. And by no means, this show is not sponsored by VA Composites. It's just, it just <laughs> happens to be something we believe in, the best shaft in the world. Um, yeah, you know, I think, um, I know you're a big believer on that, on, on kind of the tracking and, and when somebody's playing golf and, you know, like, a, uh, you know, playing nine holes when you can track distance and, and not only distance, but what clubs are using and pretty much what the Arcos thing's doing. Yeah, huh? just the stats. I mean, if you don't know, a lot of people don't even know the basics, you know, what percentage of putts does a PGA Tour player? So that's mm-hmm. going to be the top of the line. The mm-hmm. best PGA Tour player in putting, what is his stat? And what's the guy, you know, 10 or 20 behind him? And that statistics, putting. And, you know, they're, you know, whatever, 1.74 putts per hole or, you know, 28 to 29 putts per round, or they make, you know, 30% or 40% from 10 feet. And all of a sudden, you don't feel so bad yourself when you're missing a couple. You have to start to appreciate the probabilities. Right. And then you just kind of extrapolate out. You start, you work your way back towards the tee box. And what average number of fairways should you hit off the tee? It's right. not 14 out of 14. That's, that's an outstanding round. Um, I mean, unless you're just kind of, popping it out there 150 200 yards but yeah and i think um you know all that information combined with um the information we use now for club fitting you know by using track man or flight scope or whatever it may be uh for fitting golf shafts and fitting clubs right when you when you put all that information together along with a good fitter i think man you know things are going to get really good here we just uh I think people just need to learn a little bit more about club fitting. And, you know, I think the majority of the people still to this day think it's, you know, how fast, how fast do you swing? Right. You know, right. And that's, a, that's your an RS, RS flex or X flex or whatever it may be based on that. And there's so much more to it. Sure. You know, I'll tell you too, I think there's gotta be ways to, to make access to the game a little easier, different ways to enjoy the game. So you and I played the cradle, what a week ago. Mm-hmm. That's an incredible experience. To it go is. out there in 45 minutes, you know, casually walk around, meet some interesting people, have fun for that short little, all the time that you might have, you know, in that moment. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's working on an important part of the game too, the short game. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Uh, we went to, uh, uh, we went to the crate. Was it last Saturday? Mm-hmm. Last Saturday. And, and it was so crowded. They paired us up with four women from Raleigh and <laughs> who were down for a spa weekend. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, we still did it with six people in, I don't know what, an hour. I thought we were going to be frustrating some people behind us, but no, we all played. Well, there well. was like an eight some behind us. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't true. That's could true. have been that bad, <laughs> but that you're right though. I think, um, that whole type of golf, it's kind of like top golf on a golf course. Right. I mean, they've got music playing, they've got, a bar out there, you mm-hmm. know, people aren't too serious about what's going on. Uh, you know, the, I was just looking today, I, went, I drove by there today, the lowest, I think the lowest um, record right now is 19. 19? Wow. For for nine holes, right? Can that be? Uh, or, or would that be 18? It could be. It certainly could be. So they've got a birdie on every but one. You like a mathematician, man. <laughs> Nine times. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens? They had a hole in one. What would that be? Well, they might have had a hole in one, and and then they had two bogeys. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how much time or we two, have two here bars, today, so that you can give us every scenario, because I'm sure you can come up with every scenario <laughs> possible. I don't think I could do that, but I probably played every scenario. No, I have. I played every scenario on the on the other side, which is you know, 19 bogeys or you know whatever, 20 double bogeys or something. Yeah, that's crazy. But that was a good time. You know, it's um, nothing better than music, booze, and playing golf. That was fun. Yeah, be perfect weather, too. That's truly what life's about. Well, thanks for coming down, man. You know, I know it's a a Sunday, and uh, I think I pulled you out of uh, some of that lawn work that you love to do. No, that's done yesterday. Today you get all that pine straw raked up, man? That's uh, pine straw is done. It's just uh, picking up leaves now. Mm, that sounds fun. Yeah, exactly. Are you going to trim those trees? Uh, they're almost done. 
only takes me about a month. Hey, if you need some help, uh, don't call. I'll you. give you. I'll give you my line guy's yeah, number. Thanks, I appreciate that. No, thanks for coming down, man. It's uh, episode one, um, hopefully of uh, of a new podcast. It's, uh, we're gonna have some fun, and uh, hopefully, people will uh, will think the same. So sounds good. All right, cool. We done.